Thanks. This is a patient that I just saw recently and is in the process of being worked up and plans made. 52-year-old woman with asymptomatic abdominal lymphadenopathy. She entered menopause in 2016. She had slight spotting in 2018, so an ultrasound was performed. And there was a question of an ovarian hypochoic mass uh, that turned out to be a cyst. But also on MRI, she was found to have two mesenteric masses, 3.4 by 3.9 by 3.2 centimeters, which we'll see in an enlarged mesenteric node. She came to the lymphoma clinic. We did a PET and we'll review the uh, findings there, but the SCV max by report was nine and comes into some importance here. And a CT directed biopsy was performed. Her exam was unremarkable. Her laboratory studies were really unremarkable. Her AMC was very good at 340. Could we see the radiology, please? Absolutely. Hello, I'm Derek Johnson. I'm another one of the nuclear radiology fellows. Uh, the imaging started off with uh, pelvic ultrasound and pelvic MR, but I will spare us those and go straight to the. Uh, we, do we need to move that to the middle screen, or we're good? So the yeah, you stay on the right. PET CT was performed on December thirteenth, and findings as you can see in this MIP image, there was some questionable uptake in cervical lymph nodes or the nasopharynx. We'll look at that a little more closely. These two retroperitoneal or abdominal masses, both. As you indicated, maximum SV was 9.0 in the 3.6 centimeter larger mass, and some additional smaller lymph nodes in the abdomen. Uh, just kind of going through and showing you some of the, the findings. A little bit of likely inflammatory uptake here in the nasopharynx. I mean, for the time of year it is, and several small associated cervical lymph nodes will go down primarily within level two. Again, this is a very good look for infectious slash inflammatory findings. The SCV maxes in the neck range between mid threes to mid fours, uh, a fair amount lower than we're going to see down below. Really nothing for hypermetabolic adenopathy or any abnormality in the thorax other than the scoliosis we're seeing here. Getting down to the kidneys. And here we start getting into this you know, this is the more inferior and slightly smaller of the two masses. Down a couple smaller lymph nodes right in the central mesentery there. And then the larger and most hyper hypermetabolic with SEV max of 9.0 there in the uh, left pelvis. So we go down a little bit further. This is the ovarian cyst that was mentioned it appeared benign in MR and just normal bladder so discounting the nasopharynx and the probable inflammatory adenopathy in the neck really there's nothing above the diaphragm I'm sorry and then went on to biopsies you notice sort of a suboptimal amount of hand visualization <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we usually Madam don't Jerry. see that. <laughs> Could we see the pathology, please? Yeah, thank you. So I have a fine needle, or, uh, sorry, neocore biopsy of the mesenteric mass from December 18th. And from low power, you can see again that there's this atypical lymphoid infiltrate. Those pale areas, hopefully you can appreciate, give it a vague nodularity. But it also is growing in a diffuse manner like we see here. Dive down in. You can see that the majority of the cells are these small lymphocytes with condensed chromatin and just these angulated nuclei compatible with small centrocytes. Uh, occasional, maybe a large centroblast, or maybe, maybe more so that guy there. So mainly small centrocytes make up this proliferation. Here's CD20. So again, Mark says a diffuse proliferation of neoplastic B cells. You didn't believe me about the nodularity. Here is CD21, which highlights some underlying FDC meshworks. But again, also a diffuse pattern like we see here where they're absent. These neoplastic B cells stain for the germal center markers CD10 and BCL6. So here's CD10. A normal germal center B cells should not show co expression of BCL2 and 
can get a good spot. That's what you see here. This brighter staining corresponds with nicer is where we saw the CD10. So we have aberrant expression of BCL2 by these germinal center cells. So compatible with the diagnosis of follicular lymphoma, low grade, grade 1-2. Okay. So I counted those cervical nodes as, as positive. She really wasn't infected or recently yeah. infected, and so it's for the sake of the discussion. But So she had 3.9 centimeter mass, an AMC, which was less than 570, a GALF score of zero, a FLIPI of two, a normal uh, bone marrow and beta-2 microglobulin, and an SCV max of, of nine. So we haven't had a discussion about the initial treatment of follicular lymphoma, but she and her husband are extremely well-read individuals. Um, she's an RN and her husband and, uh, is a, a very well-read individual. And so the, I'll just start with just a couple of dis discussion slides. So the, the, the Prima uh, PI is being, uh, we, we, collaborated with uh, the uh, Gilles Solis and their group and and it's much simpler than the flippy and it just relates to uh, beta 2 microglobulin and bone marrow involvement and 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 you can see that the uh, uh, progression free survivals and low intermediate and high high means they're both positive low means they're both negative and uh, the uh, uh, intermediate the marrow is positive and you can see the overall survivals with the uh, flippy, and then what our data was with this was the Prima data, and this was the MER data. And the um, so she falls in a good group there. And and also in this uh, we, we we demonstrated that if you achieved an EFS twenty four, the Prima PI really held up, and it held up better than the flippy. So the cause of death paper also came out very recently in 1,600 patients. The 10-year overall survival in French data set was 80%, and in uh, our data set, 77% out of the MER. And the 10-year cumulative incidence of death as a result of lymphoma is higher as a result of all of their causes who failed to achieve the EFS 24 and for patients with a history of transformed lymphoma. And so if we begin with the end in mind, I think we've got to be thinking about these things as we manage these patients now too. So here is the survival curve of the pooled analyses. And then this is by age less than or equal to 60, 61 to 70, and then greater than 70. So she's down here. So there's only, you know, we're only going out to 12 years here and she's young. Um, so we don't know the 30 year data here. But if you transform, um, there's a definite significant increase in the mortality uh, rate, uh, and now this is all formally published. For AMC, Steve was very involved in this uh, with uh, Ryan Wilcox. By AMC, she uh, looks very good. And uh, then uh, this paper also just came out in JCO by the Nordic group. Uh, Eva Kimby was the senior author. They had 321 patients. They they, they were treated with uh, uh, they, 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 the, the follicular patients who required new therapy within 24 months because of early disease progression. The 10-year survival rate was 59% versus 81% if they were in longer remission. But 36% of the patients they treated in the Nordic trials that got rituximab only uh, were 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 out uh, 10 years. So it's it can be. Uh, a very active approach. And I, I previously showed a slide, the other case about the uh, uh, red calls trial. So then this is the long-term follow-up of the PRIMA study. So these this, these are patients who, who got RCHOP. They had to reconsent them. And the medium progression progression free survival, if you didn't get maintenance with Tuximab was four years. If you did get maintenance was 10.49 years. Statist statistically significantly different and the time to new treatment was different, but the mortality rates were no different. Then the obinutuzumab data has come out and there's a progression free survival improvement with obinutuzumab, uh, but no overall survival differences. And then in that trial buried in the original presentation and not really drawn out in the paper very well, if you got bendamustine regimen with the antibody, the, the, the death rates were 42%. If you got CHOP 1.2 and CVP 
0.7, and these were all based, these were not randomized, these were set or choice, but that's what happened. Now this abstract we just, just uh, got presented at, uh, at AOSH and the Bionic trial, and this reports that if you have an SCV max of greater than 7, there's a difference in the four-year progression-free survival. There's a, four, there's a difference in the four-year overall survival also, and in the predicted 24-month uh, uh, progressive disease failure or an EFS, PFS type definition. And these are the, so these are the uh, different, uh, uh, this is the overall survival, this is progression-free survival. And then uh, looking at other data about this, uh, the, uh, we'll go through the numbers, but the SCV max was strongly predictive uh, of the early uh, progressive disease at two years. And this was the bionic trial. It's a bendamustine uh, rituximab-based regimen, and I won't go through the different arms. Uh, PET is not recommended in, uh, by the NCCN guidelines, uh, only for limited stage disease. Um, and uh, uh, I'll, uh, these slides will go. So with this, um, we'll go back to our uh, summa summative uh, slide of this patient. What, what should I do with her? <laughs> Gotta give me something to do. To what, do you, what does she want to do? <laughs> In the end, she's going to do what I recommend. That's what she's going to do. But they've done a lot of reading, and I've spent a very significant amount of time with them already, more than most. In fact, I went into Joe's room, and he said, "Yeah, the discussions. And the discussions is only Joe could say are getting harder in this disease because there's a lot you can do now." Mm -hmm. I think the one thing. When you look at people that get in trouble with effects of BR, I think it's really important to keep in mind that after BR times six, your CD4 counts are likely to be low. If you don't pick up on that and prophylax, you're, you're going to have opportunistic infections. And I think you get in a lot more trouble when you add the maintenance for tuximab. So I actually still like BR. It's a lot easier to tolerate than RCHOP. Uh, but I watch CD4 counts at the end, and I don't give maintenance for what it's worth. I don't give maintenance, and now I'm prophylaxing with both tri trimethylamine sulfamethoxazole and acyclovir. Mm -hmm. And uh, Andy Zellnitz won't use BR. Steve, thoughts? So I think, as you pointed out, uh, it's a long conversation because there's not a right answer. <laughs> um, and and I, I kind of think, for me, patients land in three buckets. The okay. first is an asymptomatic patient, which she potentially is. She is. Um, She's asymptomatic. Who doesn't need treatment, and observation remains a very appropriate uh, strategy. The problem is watch and wait is typically watch and worry for a lot of people, and so that then potentially puts people in a second bucket, and that is do uh, some treatment, but treatment that's modest gives some benefit but doesn't necessarily cause a lot of damage. And that's where a rituximab alone approach uh, is very reasonable. And although you can do four doses with maintenance, I think the resort trial showed that retreatment is as good as anything. <clears throat> and so the watch and worry group, as well as the group that needs a little bit of something, and maybe she's that patient, I think rituximab alone is very appropriate. And then as Dave said, the third group are the people that really do need treatment because you want to head off problems. And then there's a lot of debates about what that could be, whether it's bendamustine plus binutuzumab, bendamustine plus rituximab, whether you add maintenance or you don't. Um, there's a lot of discussion. I think in my mind this patient fits in one of the first two groups and comes a lot down to how much the worry is the factor. Worry is going to be a huge issue here, so observation mm -hmm. is basically off the So table. then I would recommend four doses of rituximab followed by observation and retreatment when she progresses. In these situations, do you ever tell them that let's repeat scans in three months and get get a sense of the trajectory of the disease, and if we see a change, we'll treat. If we don't see a change, we continue observation. Or do you not I've use been scanning doing it for as an approach? Thirty-two years. <laughs> the, question is, yes. the question is, yeah. when is, is it three months? Is it six months? Or is it twelve months? And in her with the size of the lesions, and then the SCV max abstract really intrigues me, but yeah. she 
Yeah, that that. Why would you observe but, somebody with that data? Well, that's this is this is the quandary. <laughs> this is the quandary. If that was me. I wouldn't want you to observe me. And and, and what she and her husband want are what. It's going to be my best treatment now. Well, you know the other change, the, the other challenge here is that NCCN recommendations don't do a pet up front. So I don't know how many people are having trouble getting pets paid for. Um, in people, in particular, people that strike me as having a little more active disease, I often get a pet just because I want to make sure we biopsy the right node and there's a transformed disease. So I'm a little uncomfortable with the insurance company. Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. Well, uh, there, there are individuals who don't believe in PET scans, and we'll go through some of that information or those individuals. But these are the longest return visit conversations you have. <laughs> you know, most other diseases, it's pretty straightforward. But you need to do it. Uh, so I, I guess the, the consensus I'm hearing is that we have three options, and those are the three options. I it's number seven. Why, I, why would you want to observe somebody that you have data that with her SUV she yeah. she could get into trouble, and if she gets into trouble, her survival's worse. Well, then I go to seven or one, and I, oh, okay. I, I'm to the point. I got to the point of number one on her. I mean, I, I thought single agent rituximab. I'm a little biased in part of that trial. I, I think I've been around rituximab. I, I wouldn't rule out four either. To be honest, <laughs> from barrels. <laughs> well, no four. She won't go for it. She won't. I mean, that's easy. Don't. No, do I, I presented that also. Uh, four. She wasn't interested in. But I I, I like the four option actually. But I'll go back to that. Oh. So I'll, I'll, what I'll do Don't is talk to, to her it. about all four things, but that that, uh, that that concerns were expressed about observation. And I don't think she has an issue there because she doesn't want to be observed. I find most people, so, when they think about it, will decide that for you, whether yeah. they want to be observed. <laughs> so with that, um, I appreciate the discussion.